Amen. I missed you very much. I tell you what, from all the churches I went, now don't tell them this. They had great praise and worship team, but ours is just better. <laughs> I didn't say that, right? Amen. It was so great to be back home, and I'm just looking at everyone's faces. I really did miss you as we were traveling, but I do know that um, you've been praying for us as we were praying for you, and uh, really, as Pastor Zubeda said, we, we missed you guys terribly. South Africa and here, we just have a culture. And I think, you know, all over the world, really, we are the most friendliest people. Amen. You know, um, sometimes I was looking at people, you know, either serving us or the hotels we were going to or the different authorities. They don't smile like we smile. I'm serious. When we came back and flew down and walked through immigration here at the airport, all our people just had this great smile on them. So South Africa is really... Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray. Father, today we just want to thank you. Thank you for our wonderful church. Thank you, Lord, for the praise and worship. Thank you for the leadership of the church. Thank you for the pastors, the elders, the deacons, those that serve. Thank you for every man, every woman, every family in this church, Lord. We highly value them and treasure them. Thank you for those that have brought in priestly, Lord, offerings. I pray multiply their seed a thousandfold. May they experience abundance upon abundance in the name of Jesus. Help me preach the word. Help me by the Holy Spirit, Lord, to say only what you want me to say, Lord God. Let every word be seasoned with grace, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, before you take your seat, please turn around, shake the hand of one person, say, Good morning, and then you may be seated. Hallelujah. Wow, well, praise the Lord. Amen. Well, it's just good to be back home. Amen. And um, as Pastor Zubeda said, we, I really worked very hard. I need, I said to her this morning, I need two days rest, just to rest. This morning I was numb when I got up to pray. Pastor Zubeda phoned back and she wanted to know whether um, I'm dressed. I didn't fall back to sleep again. This is the first time I worked so hard, really, you know, on a short compressed trip, but people really made a demand, and we went on meetings Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday night, spending time with the pastors in the week, and having lunches with people, having suppers with people, but these were not small groups, they were 10, 12, 14, 18 people at a time, but each one drawing off you, and you know, each one making a demand of the anointing of God, so it has been really grueling, but it has been good, I said it has been good. Now, the church in Dubai, they were graced to speak, uh, have speakers like Pastor Benny Hinn, Morris Sorello, and world-class speakers. And then I had to go and preach there on uh, Thursday night. Their Thursday night is equivalent to our Sunday morning worship, because Friday is a holiday for them. So Sunday is church night. So I was trying to get my whole mind, you know, um, kind of reconfigured because simply I was trying to rush through the meeting on Thursday night. Simply, I'm thinking in my mind it's computing at its midweek service. But it was Thursday and I preached for over an hour and something. But the word of God flowed and people were really touched. And uh, we thank God for that. Amen. Now, I want to share with you uh, Psalms uh, 4. Um, there's only eight verses in Psalms 4, but I want to read to you from verses 1 to verse number 8. And um, I really struggled to give this message a title, uh, but I came up with these words, you are a problem solver. All right, so turn around to your neighbor and say, you are a problem solver. Amen. Now, Psalms chapter 4, verse number 1 says, Hear when I call, O God, of my righteousness, for you have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Verse 2, How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness? 
and seek false with Sila. Verse 3, but know the Lord had set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when they call on him. Verse 4, be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still, Selah. Offer the sacrifices, verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Verse number 7, you have put gladness in my heart. More than in the season that their grain and wine increased. Verse number 8. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me to dwell in safety. But out of the whole psalm, which I think and consider to be a beautiful psalm, but I want to pick out of that whole psalm just verse, one verse, and that's going to be my foundational scripture this morning. And that verse is verse number four. Verse number three, rather. And so I'll read it again to you. It says, but know that the Lord had set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when you call on him. Now, the, the, the amplified version just says it kind of very nicely. The same psalm, verse number three, and I'm reading in the amplified version. It says, but know that the Lord had set apart for himself, in brackets, and given distinction to. In other words, it's talking about us. As believers, God has given us distinction. <laughs> In other words, he has set you apart. Almost like he's elevated you. That's why when people will give you favor, others will wonder why. And they think you earned it by merit, but it won't be by merit. It is just God's grace. And God's favor. Now, I know that you have challenges like everybody else. I know that you have problems like everybody else. But remember the title of my message, you are a problem solver. Now, God wouldn't call you a problem solver if there were no problems. So, you are a problem solver simply because there are problems and you are the one that will solve it. Say amen to that. It says, but know that the Lord had set apart for himself and given distinction to him who is godly. The man of loving kindness or the woman of loving kindness. The Lord listens. You should write that down if you're taking notes. The Lord listens. It's a statement of fact. The Lord listens and heeds when I call on Him. That means we should have such assurance this morning that God listens to us. Now, I would like you to please, if you might, don't mind, turn to your neighbor and say, God listens to you when you call. You've you, you got to have that in your mind. You've got to have that in your psyche. You, you've got to understand that God listens to you when you call. You, you don't have to do anything. To, listen very carefully. You don't have to do anything to have him listen. you just got to believe that when you pray and when you call on him, he does listen. It is not by any good work that causes God to listen to you. It is not any merit. It is not anything on your part. It is just God's grace. And it is just God's loving kindness and God's mercy towards you. You don't have to fast so that God can hear you, but you should fast. 
You don't have to pray so that he should hear you, but you should pray. You don't have to live a mistake-free life for God to hear you, but you should endeavor to do so. So what I am saying that we take out the work because God just loves you. Because once you gave your heart to the Lord and became born again, God set his seal of approval on you. And he earmarked you for greatness. Come on here, somebody. He sealed you for greatness. And he stamped you as his own. In other words, God has given the earth to man to run on this universe. So God is waiting for us to take our place. And he's looking to us to show himself strong on the earth. In other words, he's looking for you and I to do what he's called us to do. And that's why when God wants to solve a problem on the earth, he will look to you. While religious folk, now listen very carefully to what I'm saying. Religious folk will always say, God, move. Mm. God won't move until he has a man or a woman that will move on his behalf. That's why when Moses came before the Red Sea and Moses shouted unto the Lord, actually the Bible says Moses cried unto God, God said to Moses, why are you crying to me? Well, Moses does what religious people do. Moses does what the religious church do. They cry to God day and night. And God asked Moses a question. He says, what do you have in your hand? And when Moses said a rod or a staff, what did God say to Moses? He said, stretch it forth. And when he did so, the ocean split. And Israel's problem was solved. I want to share with you this morning that you are God's problem solver. We don't have to cry to God. Yes, of course, we will pray because of intimacy. We will pray and speak to God because of communion. We will have to do that. God speaking to us. We speaking to God. We communing with God. We are speaking terms with God. But here's the issue. When we speak, God moves through us. You are God's problem solver. Well, many of the Christians today are crying, God, take away the problem. God says, no, I'm not going to take away the problem because you are the problem solver. Come on here, somebody. Catch what I'm saying to you this morning. Well, turn to your neighbor and say, you are the problem solver. So don't pray your problems away. Just ask the Lord to give you the wisdom to handle them. Say amen to that. So you are here for a reason. You are on this earth for a reason. You are in a family for a reason. You are in this church for a reason. You are in your company for a reason. You are in the job you have because of a reason. You run the business you have because of a reason. Say amen to that. So this is what I want you to do from today. Begin to embrace your assignment. Whatever assignment you have, begin to embrace it. You are not a mistake. I said, you're not a mistake. Now, the enemy wants you to feel like a mistake. But God doesn't give birth to mistakes. I am not a mistake. You are not a mistake. We are not a mistake. Everyone has a God-given assignment. And you are functioning in that God-given assignment. And I want to add to that. I said first at the beginning, you are a problem solver. Let me share this and amplify that thought. You are a master problem solver. You are a master problem solver. Say amen to that. Amen. Moses solved problems for the Israelites. Think about it. Go and read the book of Exodus. Whenever the people were stuck, who did they turn to? They turned to Moses. Moses solved the problems for the Israelites. Aaron solved the problems for Moses. Moses stuttered. Aaron spoke. 
Moses hesitated. Aaron ran. He wanted to engage. God, when Moses tendered the excuse and said, God, I'm a stutterer. I cannot speak. God said to Moses, Aaron will speak for you. But the point being, Aaron solved Moses' problems. Jonathan solved David's problems. David, or Jonathan rather, was assigned to David. Jonah, when God wanted to solve the problems of Nineveh, he assigned Jonah to Nineveh. Say amen. God assigned a young girl who was a servant, a handmaiden, to solve Naaman's problems. Naaman was a mighty man. He used to commune and talk to the king. He was a general in the king's army. He was a great man, a man of great stature. But yet it took God to use a handmaiden, a servant girl, to speak wisdom to a great man. God used the handmaiden and assigned her to solve Naaman's problem. Because when Naaman was very upset when the prophet told him to dip himself seven times in the Jordan and he went away very angry. It was the servant girl that said, Master, should you not listen to what the prophet had said? It was a young servant girl who solved Naaman's problems. The Bible said, excuse me, the Bible says when he went and did what the prophet asked him to do, he got healed. Ruth was assigned to Naomi. You are assigned to somebody. In the company where you are, you are a problem solver. See, we always say, why do they come to me? I want you to change that. They come to you because you are a problem solver. They have to ask you because you have the wisdom of God. They have to come to you because you got God's seal of approval. They have to ask you because when you ask God, He answers your prayer. Amen. Say amen to that. So you are a master problem solver. So now I want you to throw that out the window when you always ask, why do they come to me? Why do they trouble me? No, they're not troubling you. They're making a demand on your ability. Because you have an assignment. Say amen to that. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you are assigned to solve somebody's problems. You think you come to church because is this by mistake you're here? No. God assigned you here. And that's a weak amen. I said God assigned you here. God led you here. God joined you by His Spirit. You are here for a reason. Tell your neighbor, you're here for a reason. You, you might think you're not being significant, but you don't know how many lives you're touching. You don't know who you're influencing. You don't know who you're encouraging. And sometimes we look at the young children and we think, well, perhaps they're not taking, you know, uh, kind of example from us. You know, the young kids are watching us. They're watching how we praise the Lord. They're watching how we sing. They're watching the musicians up on stage. You don't know what the young kids are desiring in their heart. There are many of the young children that are watching the praise and worship here and say, I wish I want to be there. I wish I could sing like that. I wish I could play drums like that. Come on here, somebody. They're desiring something. Why? These people, their lives are speaking volumes. Their lives are a message. Your life is a message. I said your life is a message. So you are making an impact. And many times you think you're not making an impact. But let me remind you this morning, your life is making an impact. Would you whisper to somebody, your life is making an impact. Don't, don't think you're unimportant. You are very important in God's economy. You are God's problem solver. You are God's master problem solver. Say amen to that. All right, let me go a little bit further. You are a healer to someone that is sick. You're a counselor to somebody who needs counsel. You are a life jacket to someone that's drowning. Someone, somewhere, 
whether it's work, whether it's in your social life, whether it's in your home life, whether it's in your church life. Somebody is drowning in life, but they're looking to you because you are their life jacket. You are their support system. God put you in their lives, not by mistake. It is a God-given assignment. Say amen to that. You are a lifter of someone that has fallen. You're a lifter of people around you. You say, but pastor, I'm not perfect. That might be true. But God doesn't look for perfect people. God looks for available people. As long as you're available, God will use you. Say amen to that. Sometimes we wait to be perfected or we wait to be perfect before God uses us. No, God just wants you available. And if you make yourself available, God will use you. Say amen to that. You are lifted to someone that's fallen. But you have asked this question a thousand times. Why am I here? Why me, Lord? What is my purpose, Lord, in this life? Well, those are very good questions. And because you ask these questions, you deserve an answer. And this question is answerable. You deserve an answer. Because number one, God is the manufacturer. Number two, you are the product. And number three, God has given us a manual, which is the Word of God, to solve every problem. So every problem we will ever encounter is solvable. You didn't catch that. I want you to catch that. I said every problem you will ever encounter is solvable. There is no problem that is unsolvable. Sometimes the enemy wants us to be overwhelmed by the pressure he puts on us. He wants, us to give, he wants us to get to a place where there's no hope. He wants us to be suicidal. He wants us to give up in despair. But I want to remind you this morning, according to God's word, every problem is solvable. Say that loudly with me. Every problem is solvable. Say every problem is solvable. Shout it out to me. Every problem is solvable. You can do it. I said you can do it. You will win in this life. You're not a loser. God does not give birth to losers. Say amen to that. Some people run before their time. Some people give up before their time. Some people throw in the towel before the time. Somebody gives up their Christian walk before the time. God doesn't want you to do that. God wants you to pursue. God wants you to press on. God is saying this morning, you are the problem solver. Say amen to that. You were created to bring pleasure to God. Amen. Every one of you were created to bring pleasure to God. By you serving the Lord day after day, month after month, you are bringing pleasure to God. The fact that you come to church, you're bringing pleasure to God. The fact that you pray, you bring pleasure to God. The fact that you bring your tithes and offerings, you bring pleasure to God. The fact that you help somebody, you bring pleasure to God. The fact that you solve problems at work, you bring pleasure to God. Say amen to that. The fact that you're a Christian, you bring pleasure to God. And sometimes when we look around and we see so many other people and so many other faiths serving God, we become overwhelmed to say, but Lord, why are we not this robust? Why are we not like this? But let me tell you something. God has got His people. And that's you. I said, that's you. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. I was traveling in the plane. I was amazed to notice every now and again a lady would get up and then go to the back of the plane with the prayer mat to pray. And I overheard one of the ladies in the plane ask one of the stewards and said, where is the prayer place? And he said in Arabic, oh, at the back, like it was normal. I said, dear God, how many Christians are on this plane? But here's this woman praying. Now, I'm not against that. I'm not making any derogatory statement. That's her faith. But here's the issue, guys. We are problem solvers. Amen. Say amen. amen. Too long have we been following from behind. It's about time we lead. Amen. I said it's about time we lead. Amen. I'm not against anybody. I'm not being derogatory. Well, bless the Lord, whoever they are serving and what they're doing. But I'm saying to you that you need to stand up and take your place. Because God needs you wherever you are. Your environment is important. Your environment will never succeed without you. I said, your environment will never succeed without you. Your sphere of influence will diminish if you don't take your place. 
So God is saying to me to tell you this morning that you are the problem solver. Say amen to that. You will solve problems. Don't be afraid. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. Don't worry about the Goliaths that will scream at you, whether they be at work. You know, sometimes we get intimidated because of the gift of the God. Some people can talk a lot, but they can produce very little. And by their speaking, they intimidate you. And by their stature, and by the way they dress, and by the way they conduct themselves, and by the things they do, we get intimidated and say, oh God, you know, they're doing all of that to achieve fame. But let me tell you something, God will promote you, and God will elevate you, and God will lift you up. You don't need to do anything other than the word of God to get where you get, you, you're going to. Joseph was in a foreign law, land, God promoted him. And I don't care how many people that are non-Christians in the environment that you have, God will still promote you in the midst. Come on here, somebody. It was Pharaoh that issued the decree to Joseph. He said, wherever this man shows up, you will bow the knee. I'm telling you, God will promote you. God's got his hand on you. Say amen to that. You were created to bring pleasure to God. You've been set aside for an exclusive plan and for an exclusive purpose. And for an exclusive reason. Now, let me go on to my second point. Every product contains more answers than we first realize. Study the car. The fact that it moves shows you the purpose. It has a different purpose to a home. A home accommodates you. A home causes you to rest. But a car, its purpose is to transport you. It's to move you from one place to another. Compare a cricket bat with a sandwich. One is hard and the other is soft. One has a purpose. Of striking a ball. The sandwich is soft. It has a purpose of satisfying your hunger. Each one of you has a purpose. The hardness of one and the softness of the other is an obvious clue to their purpose and that their purpose differs. Say amen to that. That means you have a purpose. It doesn't matter of your personality. It doesn't matter how you react. It doesn't matter about your psyche. It doesn't matter how you look. God has given you a purpose. You are unique in that purpose. No matter where you are, no matter how you are, how you react, how you speak, God's uniquely created you, designed you like that because you will solve problems on His behalf. Now, I want you to say this loudly with me. Say, I'm a problem solver. I'm a problem. Say it one more time. I'm a Amen. Amen. Studying your difference will produce an incredible revelation of wisdom. Don't be intimidated because you're different. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Different because of a reason. You might not be the same like the brother that's sitting next door to you. It might not be the same as me, but we're different. But we all have our purpose. We all have our assignment. So you are a problem solver. Mechanics solve car problems. Lawyers solve legal problems. Ministers solve spiritual problems. Panel beaters solve panel beating problems. So in whatever field you are in, you are God's problem solver. Come on here, somebody. And it doesn't matter at what level you're functioning. Each one of us has a purpose. I was using the restrooms in one of the airports while I was traveling. And it was a very busy airport. And people were cleaning. They had people, you know, several of them just cleaning and mopping and cleaning and mopping. I just thought to myself, if it were not for these people, how filthy will this facility be? But it was because of these cleaners that kept the facility sparkling clean. They were solving a problem. So no matter where you're functioning in life, you are a problem solver. Don't demean yourself. Don't look down on yourself. Whether you're high up functioning in business or whether you're low down,
just cleaning somewhere, you are solving a problem. And you are God's problem solver. And God has you in his mind. Say amen to that. Are you getting something out of it? So it's important to recognize your assignment. You are important. You function because God wants you to function. But your function may be different. It doesn't really matter. Your assignment is always to someone with a problem. Whenever you meet someone with a problem, it means God has ordained and given you the assignment of solving that problem. Say amen. Don't run from it. Begin to embrace it. When somebody's throwing you extra work in your, fun in your work environment, don't run away from it. God's preparing you. The more problems you solve, the more valuable you become. I want you to pray this prayer in your private time. I want to be God's number one problem solver. Say amen to that. All right. So don't run from your problems. Begin to embrace it. God is with you and within you. And do not be afraid because God has not given you a spirit of fear. Whatever field you're functioning in, you will do well. I said you will do well because God has you in his mind. God has graced you. Say amen. Why do you come to church? Because each one of you function with the corporate grace of God. When you come to church, the corporate grace of the body of Christ the grace, the anointing of God on the church, amongst the other believers, all come on your life. And when you leave here, you do not go alone. You might feel alone, but you do not go alone because you go with part of all of us. When I leave church, I don't go alone to my house. I go with a part of you. When you leave here, you don't go alone. You leave with a part of me. We all go with a part of someone. We're all encouraged by somebody. We're all inspired by somebody. Are you with me? Why? Because God wants us to go out in the world and become a problem solver. There are people on the other side of you that are waiting to be told of Christ. There's somebody that's waiting for a message from you. There's somebody that's waiting for a word of encouragement from you. Be an encourager. Now I want to end my message with nine benefits, nine exciting benefits of problems. So, is problems good or is problems bad? Problems are good. Say that with me. Say problems are good. Now don't in the week, as soon as you see a problem, say, oh. Because when David saw Goliath, he didn't say, oh, God, please help. David saw an opportunity. Because David started to compute in his mind. He said, if I take this dude down, and he asked several questions before that, he said this. He asked, he said, for the man that will slay Goliath, what will be given him? And the answer was, the king's daughter, that's a good deal, and half the kingdom. That was David's motivator. When David saw Goliath, he saw opportunity. He did not see a problem. So now in future, every mountain that comes up, don't see a problem, see opportunity. Because if you solve it, it'll be money in the bank for you. It'll be friends that you never had. Acquaintances you never had. Say amen. So let me give you nine exciting things or nine exciting benefits of problems. Number one, problems are the gates to your significance. If you want to aspire to greatness and significance, then problems is your gates. So when you start visiting problems and problems visit you, just start to change your attitude. That's my opportunity. Number two, problems link you to others. There'll be people that you will never meet if it were not for a problem. Are you with me? For every problem that visits your life, you will meet someone. God will cause you to meet somebody. And those people become significant in your life. Because no man is an island. God's created us to be interactive. God's created us to be inter, you know, interdependent. In other words, we rely on others and the gifting of others. Everybody has a gift. Number three, problems are wonderful and glorious seeds for change. 
problems are glorious and wonderful seeds for change. Number four, <laughs> this is very interesting. I'll take a minute and pause, Sila, so that you can get a hold of this. Problems provide your income. The things that's lying on your desk that you're complaining about, that you busy solving, brings you your check. Problems bring you your income. So if I were you, I'd be smart. Thank God. Say amen to that. See, you're seeing it in a different light now. You're going to be smarter now. Number five, problems birth new relationships. Every time you have a problem, you have to see somebody, you have to talk to somebody, and it births a relationship. In other words, while we complain about people that don't like us, God is adding people that do like us. And they are more for you than against you. Say amen to that. Number six, problems bring good people together during bad times. Problems bring good people together during bad times. Because during bad times, you will see your true friends. During challenging times, you will see those that love you. During challenging times, you will see those that are loyal to you. Number seven, Remove problems from the earth, and you will destroy any sense of significance of humanity. So that means, brothers and sisters, as long as we live, till the day we say goodbye to the, in the earth, you will have problems. Get used to it. It's part of life. Get used to it. Financial problems. People problems. Marital problems. Work problems. So don't exit. They are your gates of opportunity. No more resigning because you get cross. No more leaving work because oh, too many problems. Yes, that's why you're there. Solve them. The more you solve, the higher you'll go. Sometimes people come against you at work. It's not that they mean towards you because you are not nice, it's just because they're not nice. And they have a problem and they need your help. And so all you can say is, I'll pray for you. I'm praying for you. God will come through for you. That's what they want to hear. Because out there in the world is a desert. You are the oasis. You will cause people to drink out of your wells. Is that Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That means God will cause streams flowing out of you. Are you with me? So you are a master problem solver. Say amen. What number was that? Number, seven. number eight. Problems are the real reason why relationships exist. Problems are the real reason why relationships exist. And number nine. Problems bring good people together during very trying times. And when that happens, wisdom pours forth out of your life. That means if you don't encounter a problem, you will not have the wisdom. But when you have a problem, wisdom will pour out of your life to solve that problem. Because why should wisdom pour out if there's nothing to solve? Why should wisdom pour out if there are no challenges? Why will God give you, through wisdom, the map to come out of a situation if there's no situation? So in the situation, God will help you. Say amen to that. So, in conclusion, I want to say, the problem God created you to solve on the earth is called your assignment. So whatever career you are in right now is your assignment. If you're a banker, that's your assignment. If you're a teacher,
Let me try that again. If you're a school teacher, that's your assignment. If you're a baker, can you imagine if we didn't have bakers? Where will be the cookies? And the Cinnabons? And the cake? And the desert? And the cheesecake? And the ice cream? They solve our problems. Business people solve problems. Restaurant owners solve problems. Dressmakers solve problems. Tailors solve problems. Doctors solve problems. Dietitians solve problems. Ministers solve problems. Everybody is a problem solver. The praise and worship team solves problems. As when you come here after a week, just disgusted, busted, down, they teach you, ah, oh, worship the Lord. They solve your problem. Come on here. When we have an opportunity to give to the Lord, it solves a problem. Because when we sow, God says he'll open up the heavens, pour out a blessing. It solves a problem. Come on here, somebody. Church, when we have services, solve problems. Wives solve problems. I'm hungry. I don't look for the neighbor. I look for my wife. When the lady wants money to shop, husbands solve. Sorry, guys, but you'll have to pay more now. And you got my permission straight after church to go shopping. Isn't that amazing? So problems really isn't a bad thing. You are a master problem solver. Let me read in closing that scripture again to you. Watch this. But know the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear him when he calls. Brothers and sisters, remember when you call on the Lord, he will hear you. He will answer your prayers and he will help you solve problems in life. So this week, engage life with gusto. Look at everything that you're dealing with, with that as that's an opportunity for me to solve. Because you are a, wow, you caught it. You are a, amen. Did you get something out of that? All right, stand to your feet as I bless you this morning. Clap your hands to the Lord. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Even when the banks put pressure on us, they help us solve problems. They find us in a place where we can look at other avenues and don't rely on them. That's your first step to become debt free. Oh, yeah. When you buy clothing on account and they keep on sending you those statements month after month after month, then they threaten to hand you over, it solves a problem. It tells you, I don't have to buy clothing on account. I don't want these nasty letters anymore. It solves a problem. From today, I will trust God to pay cash. Amen. When your car breaks down again and again and again and again, don't be embarrassed. It's a sign that's telling you it's about time. You can trust God for a better car. Amen. I didn't say a better wife. I just said a better car. All right. So if you're going down that road, you better stop. Say amen to that. So you see, it's just our interpretation of life. Amen. So you are a master problem solver. Lift up both your hands towards heaven. So Father, in the name of Jesus, as I've shared this word with the people of God, 
I pray, Lord, O oh God, that you'd help them not only when they encounter problems, but you'd help them to solve each and every one. Give them the grace to overcome. Help them in the name of Jesus. But most of all, I pray this morning that your face will shine upon them. That you would bless them, Lord, every family, in the name of Jesus. Especially our young people, and especially our children. Oh God, I pray your favor, I pray your loving kindness upon them, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Clap your hands to the Lord, give Him praise. Amen. So you are a master. Let me hear that again. You are a master. All right, don't forget, please, the Chronicles are out this month's Chronicles. That's out. Thank you so much for your support, your love. Now, may the Lord's blessing go with you. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before you leave, just one.